Good afternoon and welcome to ESSEC Knowledge Live. During this webcast series, our ESSEC professors look at what's happening in the news and share their expert opinion. As it's live, don't hesitate to post your questions in the comments section and we'll try to answer them over the course of the show. On April 14th, 2019, the widely anticipated eighth season of the HBO series Game of Thrones began. For two years, fans had to wait to find out what was going to happen in the next one of the most popular TV series of all times. However, the fans weren't the only ones waiting. A number of brands were also waiting to ride the Game of Thrones wave to market their products. We're going to talk about the show, but don't worry, there won't be any spoilers today. And we're here with Professor Steven Segge, who's an associate professor of marketing at ESSEC. He's going to talk about how brand image should, be, should tie into a logical communication strategy he completed his PhD in marketing at Michigan State University, and he teaches and does research in the areas of customer-driven innovation, inter-organizational relationships, and marketing for startups. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Thank you very much for having me here. So, first question. Are you a fan of the show? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the show. I wasn't originally. I mean, I, I think I watched the first series and got a little bit bored and then kind of dropped out for maybe two series, two series, three series, four. Then I think my mother bought me a copy of the book. Um, I started reading the book, and then did a kind of binge of, you know, three series in a row. Caught up with series five, um, and then continued um, on from there. In fact, last night I was supposed to be working preparing for this, um, and instead I actually watched um, the fourth <laughs> episode, convincing myself that actually I was doing research for the work I was doing. So for the past few days I've been watching uh, various episodes of Game of Thrones as research, if Good. you will, for <laughs> this program. Okay. And so what does Game of Thrones have to do with marketing and brand image? Well, I think it's interesting. You look at Game of Thrones and the kind of phenomenon that it's become, it's a lot bigger than it was expected. Now, I think when they started this in the first series, I don't think they were expecting, you know, viewing figures of, you know, the, the hundreds of millions that they've got today. But as, as you rightly said in the introduction, you know, brands have been tying themselves to this. I think we've seen something like 100 brands either officially or unofficially, you know, tying themselves, tagging themselves, co-branding with Game of Thrones um, for this particular series. Um, and we've seen this all the way through, um, and it's reached its peak, I guess, with season eight, where these 100 plus brands have actually kind of tied in um, to the program. Okay, and so are these brands doing it well? Are they linking well, think, their okay. brand image to the Game of Thrones? Well, well, I think what's important maybe is to kind of walk back a little bit here and think about, you know, when, when firms are engaging in a communication strategy, they're essentially telling a story of, you know, what they are as a brand, what they represent, um, what they want to provide to the market. So, you know, when firms are, are engaging in a communication strategy, and the communication strategy involves every single touch point that the firm will actually have with the customer. So it's, you know, other customers using your brand, stores your brand is sold in, um, adverts are obviously the most powerful, some of the most powerful examples of that, but these should all be kind of in line with the general overall story that we are trying to tell about the brand. So the question is when you have these large kind of phenomena like Game of Thrones or like Star Wars or any of these big franchises, brands kind of piggyback onto um, the, the, the brand that exists with the show and perhaps in many of the times they don't actually consider what their own overall communication strategy is, what story they've been telling to the market for the past you know, five, 10, whatever, how many years they've been telling that particular story, and instead they go for a short-term hit um, you know, with uh, the franchise that they've chosen to kind of get involved with. And are there any examples of brands? Sure, I mean, you know, the, there's three or four examples that I can think of, you know, out of the 100 brands that did this. I mean, one of them, is Major League Baseball. We talked a little bit about this um, before the show. I mean, Major League Baseball, which has been kind of giving this story about, you know, family and the players, the story behind the players in the baseball, and also this notion of surprise. So anybody can win at Major League Baseball kind of idea. And then they jump in and they have these, I don't know what they're called, they're called bobbing heads or whatever they're called. They have these bobbing, bobblehead dolls, which is like the mascots of Major League Baseball teams. Uh -huh. The bobblehead doll sitting on the, the Iron Throne. And then you have mascots dressed as, you know, a White Walker or mascots dressed as another character from the show. And, you know, how does that fit in with the overall message of surprise that they've been trying to give? Or Oreo, another great example of the Oreo, which, you know, for years has been trying to give this image of playfulness. So the, the notion that, you know, they're getting kids involved, 
breaking the biscuits in half, dipping it in milk, and what do, what do you get people to do with their biscuit? How can they play with the biscuit? And this whole notion of playfulness, if you go into YouTube and look at videos for Oreo advertising campaigns, they're huge. It's all about being this notion of playfulness and very much geared towards younger people and also the youth within all of us, if you will. And then they introduce a special limited edition Game of Thrones dark Oreo biscuit. And you know, if there's, if there's many things I like about Game of Thrones, but one thing I certainly wouldn't do is allow my 10 year old daughter to watch Game of Thrones. It's not the kind of image right. or the kind of you know story that I would want her to get involved with. Another example, Red Cross, um, who did a kind of blood campaign. You know, if you donate, I think it was in April, if you donated blood to the Red Cross, they would give you a Game of Thrones poster and you'd enter a draw for an Iron Throne. Now, yes, Game of Thrones is bloody. <laughs> There's a lot of blood. <laughs> In Game of Thrones, but I'm not. Con I mean, I, in, in many ways, I think a vampire movie would be more suitable for <laughs> okay. the Red Cross than you know this kind of bloody, gory, kind of messy. So I don't think they've thought through. Yes, there's blood, but I don't necessarily, necessarily thought through all the stages of what this really means. To do. And there's other examples: Johnny Walker, you know, White Walkers mm -hmm. kind of thing, and you know, I don't know, Mountain Dew with you know special cans of Mountain Dew with Arya's hit list on it, mm -hmm. which I can't say because spoilers, no spoilers, no spoilers right. after season three for you I guess. Um, <laughs> right, I'm so far you're, behind. <laughs> so you're still on it. So yeah, so I mean there's many many examples here and they're, they're taking a short term view and sure there will be an impact of this, there will be a positive impact on this but it's also the opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. So could that money have been better spent somewhere else in separate communication that would have a, 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 a higher impact, a higher ROI if you will, than just on this you know kind of one-off shot that may also negatively impact the message they're trying to Okay, and so based on what you're saying, given the nature of Game of Thrones with the graphic images, the sex, the violence, can this be done well? And if so, how? I don't know. I mean, you'd, you'd have to really think, and I thought about this quite a lot, and you know, to try to think about brands that you would associate or that are quite successful. I mean, as you said, it's not a PG show. I mean, even France is not a PG show. Um, so, you know, it's a, a, an over 18 type show. So, how do you do this? I mean, two examples that come to mind. Quite readily, that have well, maybe three examples. One from the, the, the latest show I can give. So, OK Cupid mm -hmm. got involved with this as well, and all they did was essentially allow you to put a Game of Thrones logo on your profile so that you know you could attract people who are also involved in Game of Thrones. Now, this kind of makes sense in the sense that you know we're talking about people's interests and sharing the same interests, of course, when you consider the kind of Cersei and Jamie Lannister type love affairs that we have in Game of Thrones, the incest, the more recent auntie nephew type um, thing. Like I can't, sorry, I missed that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so the, the notion of a love affair and what love is, or you know, uh, in Game of Thrones itself, that may always be problematic. But I think on a very simple level, that's quite a good, you know, okay, Cupid. What do you like? I like football. I like baseball. I like, you know, this store, and I like Game of Thrones. There's kind of issues there. One other that I think is probably very successful is Risk. Mm -hmm. So the board game Risk, I don't mm -hmm. know if you've ever played yeah. it. We used to play, I used to play as kids. I know where Kamchatka is in Russia because I played you know, Risk as, right. a, as an 18, 19 year old. It is a war game. It is about killing, taking over the world, doing all these things. So then bringing this into Westeros and having the Seven Kingdoms and having this notion of you know Risk with the Seven Kingdoms seems perfectly logical and perfectly fit in with the whole notion of you know what Game of Thrones is about. Monopoly as well, there's a Monopoly version of Game of Thrones as well. Again, yeah, that seems fairly okay. That's a relatively adultish game anyway. So I think if you have these products that are specifically targeted towards adults, then you can have a successful long-term co-branding rather than just a short-term thing okay. that we've talked about. All right. Uh, we have a question from the one of the viewers, and it says, if a large number of brands use Game of Thrones, isn't their message likely to be lost in the crowd? Yeah, I think so. I think that's one of the big issues as well. It's diluted. Um, in what you're doing and, and you know from the Game of Thrones perspective it makes sense they have this really expensive CGI they want to do and they, they use a lot of this money that comes in from brands that actually engage in that if there are maybe five six seven eight ten specific brands that are very much focused on um, with the show and co-branding with the show then that's okay but like you said when there's a hundred you know there's a hundred odd brands then yes the message will likely be diluted and you you run the risk of yeah, I saw this advert with Game of Thrones and this brand, but I associate it then with another brand because I've seen other things and, you know, it gets confused, it gets diluted, etc. Yeah, so most definitely. Okay. And are there any other similar kind of TV phenomenon 
that's been as successful in branding and lost or friends or I don't know Desperate well, Housewives well I mean like I think you know two of them that come to mind in particular um, would be and I think it's important to mention the James Bond franchise because mm -hmm. I think I was reading somewhere that you know from 1960 to or whatever it is until the present day they've garnered revenues of around 11 billion dollars and I'm not sure if that's the total, that's the amount from the films. There's like four billion that has been garnered from co-branding with James Bond. So they often led the way. What's interesting, I think, with James Bond is today when we look at, and it started very much with um, Timothy Dalton, when he um, was, was James Bond, that's when it really started to become very focused on what do we consider James Bond to be the luxury, the fast cars, the kind of, you know, the sexy man, the kind of all these kind of different issues up to the present day. Um, with um, to Daniel Craig, who's James Bond today, we've, we've got brands like Paul Ford. He's very much focused on where, what you're wearing, and everything else. So, so you know, Tom Ford is there. Um, you know, Bollinger is there as well. There's other luxury brands that are involved. But if you look back to like 1962, Whiskas, you know, the, the cat mm -hmm. food brand, <laughs> that was actually product placed into um, James Bond at that time. So even you know back then when they first started doing this, they had no real notion of what they were doing. Right. Also, you had loads of cigarette brands that were there, which can no longer be um, advertised. But over time, as I say, probably 1987 or wherever, when Timothy Dalton got involved, that's where they started to become more professional and think about really what is the image of James Bond? What is the image of these brands? So it's the watches, the Omega watches, it's the other type of car they're driving, it's everything else, the type of pen he's using, you know, all of these things are very much tied in with the notion of what James Bond actually means. Another great example, I think, is Sex and the City. Mm -hmm. um, both the TV series and also the movie later on. So, you know, whether it be, you know, the fact that, you know, a lot of the series was shot in the Vogue offices, which totally fits in exactly with everything about Sex and the City, or Deanne von Furstenberg's office, part of it was filmed in, or, you know, Apple Computer, they're using Apple, they're, they, you know, or the, the, or the Swarovski. You know, the, all of these things are fitted in Starbucks, um, kind of tying it back to Game of Thrones, um, <laughs> um, you know, Starbucks as well. So this, all of these brands fitted in very clearly with, you know, if we knew these women and if we were these women in, in New York City, what brands would we be using? Well, we'd be using these brands. So it's very, very, very clearly tied in to what's going on. But Game of Thrones is more kind of smorgasbord of, you know, mixed things that are just kind of jumping on. Okay. And one last question, because I think we're running out of time. When the show ends, what's going to happen with these brand marketing campaigns? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because, you know, well, we're going to see pre-show, you know, spin-offs from the show and everything else. But again... That's the question. So we're, if we're looking at this notion of long-term return on investment, then you would hope that there would be some sort of continuation. But given that this is a one-off shot, then it's a very much a focus on the short term, and it probably will not be much continuation. I don't imagine we'll see in five years' time the bobblehead Major League Baseball mm -hmm. Iron Throne type on the back of everybody's car kind of right. bobbling around. <laughs> I don't imagine. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for now. Thank you very much, Stephen, for My joining pleasure. us. Thank you all for tuning in and joining us for this live webcast. Don't forget that the replay will still be available on YouTube. Feel free to watch it again, share it on YouTube with the hash or share it on Twitter with the hashtag EKLive. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.